Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. What's going on? Well, it's a bit of a uh, two-sided thing. Um, the, the devil is brought in there to, to try him or, or to test him, which is negative, or to tempt him, which is negative. The Spirit has allowed him, brought him out in, in order to test him, which is a little bit more of a, of a positive thing. And there are three lies. There are three temptations we're, we're going to look at because I think they're informative for us and our spiritual lives. First one, if you are the son of God, if you really are God's son, if you're really his beloved kid, if he really loves you, he wouldn't want you to be hungry. Just go, go ahead, make yourself some food. If he really loves you, he'd want you to be taken care of. It's trying to break the relationship. Tell these stones to become bread. Whether the 40 days is, is totally literally true or symbolically true, Jesus is real hungry. So take the easy way out. You know, get the stuff. It sounds very much, very much like Satan's first ever lie to humanity. The story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, where he says, go ahead. You're hungry. You want the good fruit? Oh, if, if God really cares about you, he'll be fine with it. Take the good stuff. Get the good stuff for yourself. Take more stuff because God's not going to give it to you. Help yourself, because God's not going to help you. You know, however we want to, you know, image the, the forces of, uh, of evil, Satan, however we look at it, we live in a world surrounded by lies. That's nothing new. Um, and the primary way that, you know, we're, we're influenced to do bad things is not by, like, Satan doesn't, like, force us to do bad things. You know, if we've got the proverbial chocolate cake here or something, you know, no one's like forcing us, pick up that fork, put it, in, eat, eat the chocolate cake, do it, do it, right? I might look a little ri ridiculous right now, but it's not forcing us to try and do it. It's a lie that says, that cake, oh, eating that cake will make you happy. And you have so little happiness in your life. You deserve every bit of happiness that you can take for yourself, and then we'll happily eat three pieces of chocolate cake because we've believed the lie about what will make us happy, how much we deserve it, how little happiness we have in our own lives. From day one, the enemy of our souls has, has been insinuating, has been telling us that God doesn't love us like that much. God is withholding the best stuff from you. I mean, God, religion, that, 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 that's all good. But, you know, God isn't up there caring if you're happy all the time. I mean, if he's God, he's got bigger things to do. He's God. So you know what? Go for it. You deserve it. Someone else might make you happier. You, this purchase, you, you deserve this. Really, like, the devil has not come up with new material in the last 10,000 years. He's a limited, broken, joyless creature who lies, and, um, well, that's pretty much it. And the thing that Satan lies about the most, by far the most, is God and how good and generous and kind and merciful and beautiful God is. He says, you're really hungry. God's busy. Just take care of yourself. If God really loves you, he'll be fine with it. That's the lie. What's the truth? The truth, Jesus says, is that there's no separating my very real need for food from my very real need for God. There's no separating my need for food from my need for God. You know, both Adam and Eve were tempted with food, kind of interesting. There's nothing wrong with food, but I think it gets to some of our um, most basic um, dependencies we need to eat and our most basic desires that we want to be satisfied and sated and, and filled and fulfill our dependencies and desires. The second temptation, he says, if you really are the Son of God, 
Go do something amazing. Impress people. He says, you know, take your, your, your father's, you know, antique convertible for a spin. Everyone will be like, wow, you're, you're, you're so cool. And, you know, your father, if you get pulled over the house, he'll bail you out. He loves you. He cares about you. Do something amazing. Be impressive. Prove yourself. And prove God. And, you know, make God come through for you, even if you're not coming through for God. Henry Nouwen says that Jesus didn't come to be a stunt man. Jesus came to love. And that's just what he does. He says, I don't have to prove God. God's already proven himself. You know, who's being tested here? God the Father is not being tested. Jesus is being tested. It's about Jesus, you know, human and divine being, be, being formed and proven. God the Father isn't being tested. Jesus of Nazareth is. I think sometimes in, in spiritual warfare, you know, we, we think that, like, we're passive pawns. We're kind of, like, stuck in the middle. It's, you know, spiritual warfare, not, like, me, me warfare. I'm just here, little old me. But it is actually all about me about my formation and my testing. And listen, I think there are very real forces of, of evil, of, of, of deception out there, but that doesn't make the devil an excuse. Sometimes you, you'll hear things like, you know, we got in the, the minivan to, to go to church, and then, you know, me and my wife got in, my husband got in a, a fight, and the kids were arguing, and it was, it was just, it was the devil. Maybe. Or, you know, maybe, you know, I was impatient and tired and said hurtful things and need to, you know, take better control for what I say before my morning cup of coffee. Could be either one. On uh, Friday, we had that snow day. Such a nice snow day. Who here enjoyed our Friday snow day? Three of you. That's great. I enjoyed my Friday snow day. Um, I think I was outside for about five hours. I, uh, we borrowed snowshoes and went snowshoeing, um, sledding with the kids. Um, I shoveled. My husband and I shoveled. I, I did lots of shoveling. I, I, I like it, actually. Um, it was a great snow day. I woke up on Saturday morning. I felt a little sore and stiff, and then I went to put on a sweater. And this shooting pain went down my back yesterday morning. I've never, like, felt that before. I think it was because of the shoveling. And as my uh, daughter was tying my shoes for me, because there's no way I can reach that far down, you know, I thought, it's Saturday. I'm preaching on Sunday. Yeah, I really like on Saturday night to, you know, go to the church. I like coming here to, to pray on Saturday night. Maybe this is like spiritual warfare that I can't go on, uh, on Saturday night. And as I eased myself into the couch with a heating pad, I thought, or maybe it's because I did my half of the shoveling in 13 minutes and then came in and bragged to my husband about how quick I did my part of the shoveling. I'm not 29 anymore. Um, but then I thought, you know what? What's the truth? The truth is, it doesn't matter that much as long as I pray on Saturday night, which I can do on my couch with a heating pad, as long as I claim the truth, I can, I can still pray. This is fine. I should also probably learn my lesson about some of my physical limits also. That would be helpful to me. But the devil isn't an excuse. Lies are real. The health of our soul being deeply grounded in, in, in God's love has never been easy. There's a battle for me that I must take some effort in. And Jesus Jesus isn't huddled there like some little kid while like his parents argue over him. He should do football. He should do soccer. You know, you know, Jesus is loved. He's approved. He's anointed by his heavenly father. All is well at home. And then the spirit leads him to, to go out, to, to take on the biggest bully there is out there and to have victory in and of himself. You know, spiritual warfare 
is not um, about God versus Satan. You know, it's an epic battle, angels versus demons. Who's going to win with little me hunkered over there on, on the side? No. We know who's going to win. Jesus has already won. Satan is a loser. Jesus is victorious. The Bible says Jesus made a public spectacle of the forces of evil, triumphing over them by the cross. Spiritual warfare is not uh, simply about, you know, God versus Satan at, at all. It's simply only about whether I'm going to fully join the winning side. It's about me, my worship, my dedication, my response, my holding to the truth, my worship and dedication. And when that's settled, which it will have to be settled multiple times over the course of my life, when that is settled, then I can get on with living life under Jesus' victorious leadership, working for healing and justice. But, and I, I really think this is real, guys, but if I think that it's like God who's being tested, and I just kind of like roll over and like, oh, I'm just in some spiritual warfare. I'm just going to hunker down here and watch a little Netflix while God takes care of this. I'm going to be like, wait, well, what, what happened? God, God failed or something. It wasn't God's test. It was my test. You know, God doesn't need to be formed how I do. You know, is your soul valuable enough? Is your character, you know, worth fighting for? Friends, it is. My soul is my life's work. I just pray, God, do your good work in me. Where there is a battle for my character, for who I am. Jesus, help me to stand firm. My soul is valuable enough. My character is worth fighting for. And our response is truth. Jesus' response every time is truth. You know, sometimes with my kids, if they get into, um, you know, an argument or, or a fight, um, I don't know how, you know, you were, how uh, your, your parents facilitated uh, sibling fights with you. They just told you to shut up and, you know, get, get over it. But, you know, I try and, you know, a couple deep breaths, let's talk this out, you know, do whatever I do to facilitate a little bit of conflict resolution. And I used to say at the end, like, okay, now tell your sister two nice things about them to, you know, kind of, you know, get the relationship back on track. And then I was like, no, I don't want them saying nice things about each other. I want them saying true things about each other. Now sometimes I'll do like, okay, two true things about yourself, two true things about the other person. But I need to do this for myself. If my husband and I get into a conflict, get into a disagreement, I need to remind myself of two true things about myself and two true things about him. Because it's so easy for us to tell ourselves, like, you know what, that, that person's not, they just don't love me as much anymore. They don't care. I have to look out for myself. I need to tell myself two true things about myself and about the other person. Third, third lie. You know, actually the third lie, the third lie, Satan, he just, he just cuts straight to the chase. No more trying to, you know, break the relationship. Just a fair all-in trade for power. The last temptation is power. And it is a power that we believe that, that Jesus does now have and will have in, in completion uh, at the end of uh, creation. There's just a terrible shortcut. The temptation is to take power. Jesus' response is to give worship to God. Again, responding not with his own words, but with the words of Scripture from Deuteronomy. Instead of taking power, we give power to God through worship. If we seek power, we will end up worshiping idols. If we seek political power, we'll end up making, you know, idols of politicians. If we seek social power, cultural, you know, influence, we'll end up buying into false systems, false packages, agreeing with everything just to get a seat at the table. It's destructive. 
for parents, if we seek power, I'll just you know, force my kids to, to do the right thing. We don't seek power. We give power to God in worship, fully and completely worshiping God. Not worshiping our experience of God. You know, Jesus, he was not having an amazing worship experience here in the, in the desert. We don't worship our experience of God. The you know, church was amazing. I feel so empowered. You know, I, I just love the way we do things. Or We worship God, emptying ourselves, giving respect and, and reverence and thanks to God. So friends, as we look at these three lies, you know, what lies are you believing? The best lies are the ones we think are true. Um, and I took the liberty of um, putting down a couple of lies that I am tempted to believe, if uh, I may share those with you. I'm tempted to believe that others don't love me as much as they could or should. That people are waiting for me to mess up as an excuse to reject or ignore me. You can imagine how this uh, is not the best way forwards in friendships or, or relationships. That little niggly voice saying, they don't love you as, as, much as, as much as you love them or you hope they love you. There's some real lies about my own happiness um, that, that I'm tempted to believe. I think that doing what I want to do will make me happy. Oh, you know, I, if I just, I'm going to read this great book and go for a run, and then this causes problems on my Saturdays because then I end up having to deal with this problem. Uh, in, in, instead, I'm going to find happiness in terms of my own preferred activities rather than happiness at, at my state of, of self with myself and with God. I can be happy cleaning the floor. I can be happy doing what, whatever job. I can be happy many things with Jesus. The best lies are the ones that we think are true. And the goal of all these lies is to break relationship, primarily with God. The biggest lies that Satan tells us are about God, that he is not as beautiful and kind and merciful and generous as he is. That faith is good, but you know what we really need to work on is this was social issue that, you know, God loves me, but the love you really want is from other, other people, that giving everything to God will leave us, you know, empty and, and broke and unhappy. What lies are you tempted to believe about what will make you happy? As we look at this passage, you know, all the question marks, um, the, the question marks are not with God. The question marks are with this new biblical character, Jesus. We're in chapter 4. We're just in the beginning of this uh, uh, story. Will Jesus pass the test? Will he be the new Israel completing the wilderness the journey? Jesus' response is one of personal integrity and faithfulness to God. All the question marks lie with me and my character, not with God. I want to refuse to take the easy way of meeting my own needs and need God. I want to refuse to test God. I want to take my own test. I want to refuse to grab power instead to give power to God and join with God's power in worship. All the question marks lie with me and all the answers are found in Jesus.